I'm very happy to be here, Harold, and uh, always it's always, always a pleasure to be with you. Anybody who knows Norman Curland and, uh, and uh, Charlie Kernigan, Charlie Kernigan, okay in my book for sure. <laughs> and it's so good to see you. And uh, welcome, welcome very much to a conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program Reverend William Christensen or Reverend uh, Bill Christensen. He's a person that I've been introducing some of my friends around the studio here as perhaps one of the very most dedicated human beings I know. He's been working for so close on to 30 years among the poorest of the poor on the planet. He's been recently in, the, more recently in the last decade, working among the poorest of the poor in rural Bangladesh. And a dedicated, beautiful human being and Reverend uh, William or Bill Christensen, welcome once again to Conversation. Thank you very much, Harold. My pleasure to welcome you, and would you share briefly, we're going to talk about the work you're doing specifically, have some rolling footage, some things to show, but would you share a little of your own background, just personally, we're born and raised, a little of that, and then we'll get into a conversation about the poorest of the poor and the work that you're doing and what there might be able to be done to help improve the, condi the condition of people at that uh, status of society. Uh, well, Harold, I was born in Chicago. <coughs> um, I know it's not a big city like New York City, but pretty big. still pretty big. Uh, windy city. Yeah, right. I was born on the south side of Chicago, and uh, I had four brothers, a sister. Uh, my dad was an immigrant from Sweden, and mm -hmm. my mother's parents immigrated from Poland. Okay. And um, in eighth grade, I had a talk from... Uh, member of the Society of Mary or Marianists mm -hmm. and um, they invited us to think of going to a school, high school, where we get the normal courses and could learn more about the Marianists. So I went to that boarding school. That was at a young, uh, be before high school? Or? That was, yeah, from 9th to 12th grade I was I there. I see, right, junior high. Right. And that was in St. Louis area. Oh, you went out of town. Then. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, then I went, I was very happy with the life of the Marianists, and I went and joined their novitiate for a year in Wisconsin. What was there about the life of the Marianists that made you happy? Well, the first thing when uh, the talk was given in eighth grade, it was about service to others. Service as a, to others. That's as a way of life. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then the experience also of living in community with others okay. was uh -huh. very great. The Marianists have what's called the family of Mary, okay. including lay people and religious together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that attracted me, and I joined, and I did my college studies in San Antonio, Texas, at a Marianist University. Mm -hmm. And then I taught for four years in St. Louis in a high school. As uh, a Marianist brother? Yeah, or as a brother. As a brother, okay. And then I uh, did my master's studies at St. Louis University in sociology, and my seminary studies also at St. Louis University. Uh -huh. And uh, I was ordained, and I taught and was chaplain at another high school in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then um, I prepared myself to go over to India. I went there, and I worked with the poor for six years, uh, and then uh, I couldn't get visa renewed because of a corrupt official who wanted a bribe to promote the uh, visa papers. Sounds like the movie Casablanca yeah. with all the intrigue yeah. for, yeah, right, okay. So yeah. I was briefly in Nepal and then shifted to Bangladesh to work with the poor there. And I've been there the last 21 years. 21 years. And you, you, you and I were speaking yesterday. We had time together yesterday and you recounted your life story along these lines of some of the uh, some of the parts included that you weren't able to include in this briefing, and I told you your life would, be, somebody should be making an option on your <laughs> life as a movie because it was incredible, the life that you had led and the things that went on were just absolutely eye-opening and so <laughs> forth. And um, I congratulate you on all of that. When you were, the, the, the Marianist, um, I, know, I know of the Mary Noel and that it's, a, it's, a, it's an order yes, within the Catholic system? It's a religious order and... Um, it's Catholic. Right, Catholic, uh, uh -huh. but um, we were started in France after the French Revolution mm -hmm. as a lay movement. Lay movement. Yeah, married people, young unmarried people, women and men, mm -hmm. and it was to bring together the people who had been divided 
before that caused the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. the, really? The poorer people, the peasants, mm -hmm. mixing them with the professionals and the church people mm -hmm. in groups to rebuild French society. They needed some rebuilding. Yeah. yeah. And so from the lay groups, uh, some women in 1816 decided to dedicate themselves permanently as religious to keep this movement going. Within France? Then. Yeah. yeah okay. And then in 1817, the next year, five men made that same commitment. Uh -huh. And gradually, the uh, religious groups also developed. Uh, in the world today, there's probably over 10,000 lay members of the Marianist family. And how many ordained? And of the uh, sisters, maybe about 1,200, and of the men religious, about 2,000. About 2,000. Uh -huh. But we don't distinguish in the men religious between the ordained and the non-ordained. Why? The brothers and the priests are equal. Uh -huh. The provincial of the province of the United States presently is a brother. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't distinguish. We, we share life together. and. Uh, you sound democratic. Yeah, we, uh -huh. we were communist. Democratic, <laughs> right, I understand. Like that. But then, then did you have a missionary outreach in terms of the world? You've been working, yeah. that, was that a personal thing or was that part of the mission statement of the Marianist, as it were? It's part of the statement of our origins. Uh, our founder said, uh, you are all Marianists, you are all missionaries, he mm -hmm. said. Who was us. that founder? Then? His name was William Chaminade of France. In what year are we talking? He started um, the lay groups in 1800. 1800? Yeah, he had been in exile um, in Spain for a while, uh -huh. but he came back after there was some peace after the uh, yeah. uh, friction and slaughter. Yeah. And then he started the lay groups and gradually the religious orders. Uh -huh. And um, he just said to the our family of Marianist, you are all missionaries. You are all missionaries with right. an idea of looking to the world. Right, huh? yeah. Okay. That's and uh, yeah. one of the first big missions was to uh, the United States of America. Over to that beleaguered <laughs> continent. Huh? In 1850. Uh -huh. So uh, today we have the largest number of um, Marianist here in the United States. Uh -huh. Spain has a very large number and now India. And India, okay. Yeah. And and you and uh, in their mission statement of the missionary statement, I don't know if it's a missionary statement, mission statement. Uh, are they concerned? As you, I know you are. I've known you for quite a while. With the plight of the least advantaged of us, as the good book used to try and say, we have an <laughs> obligation to follow, and more than say others that are more politically connected with the ruling groups that run the country, the world. Right. Well. Um, those of us who, within the Marianists, are very committed to the poorest, mm -hmm. are trying to motivate more and more the rest of our family of Mary mm -hmm. to be involved. Uh, our family of Mary, by that you mean the Marianists? Lay Marianists, Lay Marianists. and uh, religious Marianists. And are you trying to influence the broader world? Yes. Yes, okay. That's to good. me, one of the great commitments we have to make today is to help uh, bring together the poor and the non-poor, that there's a great divide, a great gap. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I spend six months every three years traveling and sharing mm -hmm. and trying to help people um, appreciate that the poor are just like everyone else. The parents want to be able to feed their children properly, to educate them and help them uh, grow up to be uh, fine men and women. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the problem of poverty is so great. If I can just show a picture. All right, fine. This is. Um, I'll hold it up yeah. here and you can talk to it then. Okay? This is a typical family from our extreme poor. We have to give them a chance to come in. Here they're coming now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 36% yeah. of our people, according to present UN figures, are living on less than $1 a day. What percentage? 36% of our How people. How can people live on less than $1 a day? <laughs> it's very hard. You see this family of six? Uh -huh. uh, that's their house in the background. Uh -huh. And right behind it is a river. Yes. Uh, the river shows that they have no land of their own. They've just put their, and that house is actually just a roof. Uh -huh. uh, but 
this family is struggling, uh, trying, you... trying to get one meal a day. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the main way they do it, by not eating very much. They eat one time a day, and uh, they um, live in extreme poor uh, housing like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So yeah. what we try to do for families like that, yes. you see this bottom oh, here's picture? Here's another picture. If you could show the bottom picture first, apparently. If you yeah. can come in on it. Uh, you got to get it in the No, first. yeah, well, they'll be, I guess they're going to come in. Can you come in on this, or you're going to try and show it to this camera? I don't know what. The same camera that we were on before, I would think. And you want me to turn it that way so come, you can see that? But if you can get it. Yeah, but the bottom picture shows, the top picture, again, shows a poor house, and the bottom one shows one with a tin roof. Yeah. For $60 on the average, we provide tin roofing for the poorest families. We can't, there we go. Okay, yeah. now the, the bottom one there, can you bring it in on the bottom one maybe? Yeah, there's, they're doing it. Yeah, there's a couple it. houses there with tin roofs. Uh -huh. So for $60 US mm -hmm. dollar, we can provide each family with tin roof. Tin roof is a big advantage over what the materials It's would be? great because uh, they don't have to repair their house every year. As they do if they don't have Right. If they have the thatch, they have to put practically a new roof on every year. Really? So they save that cost, and then it protects them. Their health is improved greatly. Um, because in, in, in Latin America, they call that calamina, mm -hmm. the, the tin roof. And that's yeah. a, a big thing. You can build an adobe structure. But then and did the front top picture we didn't want to show particularly now? No, that's just another house like okay. this. OK, OK. You want to show another one? Then? Yeah. This is um, okay. this is well, a, it's a little hard to make out, but try. It's like a lake. Mm -hmm. This was low-lying farmland, which was not very useful. Right. And we got the poor people to, we got the local people to sell it to us, 25-acre plot of land. And we got laborers to dig it out, paying them their wages for digging it out and building up the four embankments. You see one embankment in the background there yeah. with some tin-roofed houses. Yes. Those families were like the one in the first picture. Yes, okay. Extreme poor families right. who had no land and living on roadsides or flood protection levees. Mm -hmm. And we resettled now 80 families on that. Uh, Did they, you drain the water or what? No, the water came later. That came from rain. That was from rain. Is that temporary? Will that go no, away? It, no, it's, it stays year-round. Okay. Uh -huh. um, it goes down a little and then back up. Could they do any fish farming or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, we do the fish farming. You do? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. that that's, works. that's one source of their income. Uh -huh. And then they do their normal works like laboring and such, driving bicycle rickshaws, agriculture labor. We've trained 25 women from this resettlement project for uh, embroidery. All right. Yeah, we can. You can show. Yeah, we, we got some you. of that here. This is the another yeah. thing. That, uh, yeah. This is a type of the embroidery they do. You hold one side. I'll hold okay. the other. Okay. And we'll put it toward that central can. All right. Yeah. Let's hold it up like this. And See, that's the um, maybe the camera can come in on this. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's a it's a yeah. work of art. Now, if you can come back and show the whole thing. It's beautiful. This is all hand yeah. embroidered, right? Right. This and is this hand would have embroidered. been done by the people that were in that condition yeah. you were just showing us? These are That's done by the, the women who are uh, women uh -huh. illiterate. Right. They've had no education, but through our um, technical people, we have an artist who trains them how to make the designs, and they uh, uh, They develop. make the designs, or does he do the design, and they do the embroidery? They do the embroidery. He does the design. Uh-huh. Right. And it's so like an art form, right? Yeah, right. As you can see. Yeah. Let's show the other one re red, oh, since we can. Yeah. And we want to get this out of the way, okay? Yeah, we can put it on the floor yeah. behind. Yeah, okay. Whatever. And here's another one, if it'll show. Let's see how it'll look on the screen. If you see, if you can come in on this one, here's another one. There you go. Yeah. As you see, it doesn't stand out quite so well, but it's still beautiful right. embroidery work. Yeah. And they do this, and then you, they can sell this to the Western mar or the world markets. Well, yeah, it? we're doing it mainly within Bangladesh now, but <coughs> uh, there's a lot of interest as and this, I. This would be seen these. as a piece of work of art on the wall, or would this be yeah. seen as something like a tablecloth, or what would it, it be? It could be used for anything, but normally on a wall hanging, we right, call it. Right, right. You could put it it's behind glass at the yeah. Museum of Art. Right. And this, this could be put up as an art form. Yeah. Embroidery. This is 
No. Do you see the things they do down in the Ar Ozarks with quilts? No, they I haven't. Qui it's a beautiful art form, quilt yeah. making, yeah. Yeah. similar to this. Yeah. But yeah, okay. So we have 180 women now uh -huh. doing this embroidery. Uh huh. And uh, we. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Then you get some more photographs. This is eh? the fishing. Okay. Let's There's no need to show that. No. Okay. No, we mentioned it. Okay. And then we have a lot of industries. Okay, these Pe are photographs, and you can come in. I'll hold it here, yeah. and you come in. I'll these are two industries. Um, the one at the top shows um, making candy. Candy, okay. Card candies. And the one at the bottom shows chalk making for writing on blackboard. Really? In okay. schools. So we have a lot of industries. We have those kind. We have uh, making of uh, leather goods. Uh -huh. We have... Um, Making of quilts and mattresses for cold weather, the quilts. Uh -huh. We have uh, making mosquito nets, no, okay. laundry soap, uh -huh. and many others. Let's take a pause if we could. We'll show these. We'll get back to these. Now, you keep saying we, we, we in that. And you've got a group called the, what is it, Integrated? What is it again? We, we set up an organization called the Institute of Integrated Rural development. Okay, and that's, the, that's you set that up, or you yeah. and your colleagues? I was there. the founder and had some help. And from how long ago did you set that up? We got that started in 1987. 87, so that's 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay, that's a long time. It's been in, 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 in function, I think. It sounds to me similar like what I used to call, what they used to call when I was in Bolivia, community development, or is that the wrong concept, or is there a difference? Well, or uh, there are many different forms of community development, but ours is focused more on the poorest. Our goal is poverty eradication. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. Community development is we also work with the wealthy and the others to help the poor. But it's not community development in the sense everyone can get help from the project. Okay. There are certain projects like tree plantation that the wealthy are also involved in. Uh -huh. They also get sanitation at reduced rates uh -huh. to spread the uh, use of sanitary latrines and such. Oh, okay, yeah, that yeah. would be important. Yeah, yeah but yeah, the right. poverty eradication works, which are our main works, like right. these industries, uh -huh. they're only employed maybe sometimes as trainers. Uh -huh. Or the education program, they may be the teachers, the mm -hmm. educated women from mm -hmm. the better off families. Uh -huh. But their children won't be in the schools. The uh -huh. schools are just for the poorest children. I see. Well, when, if I may, just to digress for a minute down to the country, uh, the continent of South America. We lived for a couple of years in Bolivia among very, very poor people. Mm -hmm. I think it was the poorest in Latin mm -hmm. America with the exception of Haiti. And I was doing archaeological stuff. My wife at the time got very involved in it. it was that they would they would have a group, they would get together, and then they, they'd say they need a school. And I heard you say they got the, the tin roof. Mm -hmm. Now the tin roof, okay, and then they could get together and they could make adobes and they could make the walls of a structure that was to be the school. But then they got to the point where the calamina or the tin roof was beyond, they can't make that in terms of what's there immediately available. P mm -hmm. People don't have resources. So that's coming from the national economy in a certain sense, right. or from the developed economy. Right. So how did the tin roof, or the tin that makes the tin roof, get to those people through the market, or they're in touch with the established yeah. system? In the case of Bolivia, they would do that, they'd reach a point, and then there was a, uh, from the bottom up, they would have a request for the Calamina to go on, then they have a big celebration, and then that would be a, a thing that had been done by yeah. the community with sense of community spirit and involvement. Is that anything like, or is it different? We, we do that too. We, we ask the poor people that we tell them that if they want a school, we'll help. Mm -hmm. But they have to find a place in the village, and then they have to provide the uh, bamboo and grasses that okay. we use to make the schoolhouse. It's so a it'd one. Be like the adobes. Yeah, it's yeah. a one room schoolhouse. Uh -huh. uh, so if they're willing to do that, and then the mothers are willing to meet monthly. We c call it a mother's forum mm -hmm. to help involve them in monitoring the school. Uh -huh. And then they choose eight mothers who are a school managing committee. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only managing committees in the world that are illiterate <laughs> people. Uh -huh. But they, uh, they help. They keep the schoolroom clean. They make sure the teacher comes timely and does good work. Uh, they, if any children are not showing up, they go to the homes to find out why. Mm -hmm. So two of the mothers every week 
have duty right at the school to help make sure it goes well. Mm -hmm. And we give them training and we um, have usually a small nutrition program now. Mm -hmm. They get, the children get twice a week something like a, uh, each of them get a banana or a guava mm -hmm. or a hard boiled egg or a glass of milk, whatever we can afford in the budget. And we do all of this, a full year of education for 30 children costs us only $600 oh boy, that's with the good. nutrition. Okay, now let me ask you something. Why are these things that you're providing not being provided by the normal way in which the Bangladesh society is organized? Why is this just not something? Why did somebody have to come in from outside, let's say a Westerner, come in and do this? Why isn't that just something that emerges out of their society? What prevents that? Is there anybody saying that you are seen, as was the case with some people in other parts of the world, missionaries and so forth, that it's Western interference, lackeys of the imperialists that are coming in and that sort of thing in order to uh, uh, undercut their cultural values and that they just uh, are lesser people that have to be led by these Europeans? Well, there's two things there, Harold. The mm -hmm. first one is, why aren't these things in the society? And the answer of, for that is to go back into history. Yes. That in, from 1757 to 1947, uh, our area was part of the British Empire. The Rye. Yes, mm. and um, when Lord Clive got there in 1757 to our area, yeah. he described what is today our capital, Dhaka, uh -huh. as equal to London. Uh -huh. And he said the country was a paradise. Really? Um, w but with the British was efforts the yeah, go ahead. to exploit this colony for the benefit of the homeland. Exploit? Yes, In exploit. In a colonization, imperialistic way? Yes. I'm shocked. No, well, you shouldn't be. That's, I'm not. I'm that's kidding. The, that's yeah, the I history yeah, of yeah. colonialism. Yes. Um, and so the um, agriculture was devastated. They set up a taxing system. The British. Yeah, uh, where they gave control of a certain number of villages to very... Uh, powerful local people mm -hmm. who were allowed to take as much taxes as they could uh, drain from the farmers mm -hmm. as long as they paid the British the uh, amount they required. Mm -hmm. So the farmers became impoverished. They became serfs on their own land. They had to mortgage and then give their land to these tax collectors. It hadn't been that way previously? No. Oh, there was the Mughals? Uh, the, the Mughals uh, were there, but they still had their traditional way of uh, cooperative farming, you could call it, where each year land was distributed to the people according to their desire and their ability to cultivate. Your Bangladesh is it's an offshoot of uh, the Bengal language or the Bengal, East yeah. Bengali it was language and uh, uh, we had then the Vedic tradition there and we had the untouchables was part of a century, a thousands of year old thing where a uh, custom where you had all kinds of people that were by the caste system was part mm. of the context within which the subcontinent right. was operated, no? Well, it doesn't sound like it, it sounds was, hard, it was some hard that way, but but our area became mainly Muslim mm -hmm. under the Mughals. That was an advance over the Vedic uh, tradition of uh, uh, well, untouchables. The and Hindus so forth? would say no, but yeah. the Muslims would say yes. That's partly what they've been fighting. Yeah. They just anyway. celebrated 60 years of the division be of the subcontinent between Pakistan and India. Right. And, uh, just this week, yeah. in fact, the right. 15th of August, right. 40, 70, yeah. 47. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. the the colonization is what led to it becoming impoverished. Uh -huh. There were no real education or health system set up for the vast majorities of the people. There was no thought of family planning. The industries that existed were crushed or exploited. The local industries. Yeah, yeah, or, or overtaxed. So the country became uh, what Kissinger called a breadbasket case. Uh -huh. um, state well, it wasn't a state until mm. It became an independent country in 1971 mm -hmm. only. Okay. And so it, it, the government and international community is giving some help to build up things like universal education, 
but they're still far from that. When the Bre British well, Raj, oh, I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead, by all means. Let me finish the second sure. thing. Absolutely, yeah. Harold, the second thing you asked about myself being a foreigner, uh, you know, it's not me, it's our team, which right. is all Bangladeshi, except for me and sometimes some volunteers from abroad. Uh, we are a Bangladeshi organization, uh, registered and recognized by the government, and uh, we work together, our team works together. Some of the programs are developed by our uh, Bangladeshi people, some are contributed by uh, some ideas by myself, but we discuss these together with our poor people in the villages mm -hmm. and uh, everyone's participating together. It's an empowerment process. I remember as I read, I did a lot of studying of the Latin America. I spent time there and everything like that. And you had Christopher Columbus discovered the New World and that sort of thing. And he was a hell of a navigator. He was really good, but he was a terrible administrator. And the, 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 the disastrous treatment of the aboriginal population mm -hmm. wiped them out, just yeah, wiped them I out. Know. But we did have a man of the cloth. Uh, de las Casas, say, mm. who wrote about it mm. and was there trying to mediate against the worst advantages of the rapage and so forth that was taking place. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself in that kind of a role as we uh, come into the modern experience mm -hmm. and we've had colonization and since the end of the Second World War with the retreat from the Raj, we've had neo-imperialism right. or, or b yeah. bankers and right. the, the globalization thing that mm -hmm. works against the interests of the people right. and creates conditions that do not benefit them and the trends of the benefit toward them mm -hmm. by our established institutions are not serving well right. those people and you can mediate against the worst efforts of the people who run our country in the Western world? Or I, I how do know you see the, that dynamic? Yeah. I know that uh, it may upset many Americans to hear this, mm -hmm. but I see and my sisters and brothers in Bangladesh almost universally see the United States as an opponent to their development. Okay. And that because the propaganda says just the opposite. Yeah, right. We are We're there to help. Yeah, but we are mm. there to exploit, to uh -huh. keep the others oppressed so that we can remain a superpower and have more markets. Mm -hmm. We don't want the Bangladeshis to become self-sufficient and they can build up their own industries and other uh, strong agriculture because then it won't allow our multinational corporations to operate there and to drain the country of whatever wel little wealth it has. Is that your personal view? Would that be a position of the Marianist organization? Or let's that would just be my say personal, we had a, yeah, we personal had a thing view. called liberation theology that the Pope and the Catholic Church spoke for in terms of these issues. And the good book says that we should be first concerned among the least among us, and that seems to be mm -hmm. roundly ignored by our leadership yes. and by the geopolitical reality. And right? also by the religious groups often. And by the <laughs> religious groups. It's supposed to be that they will you know, bring comfort yeah. to the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's a, a yeah. theme that uh, moderates <laughs> a lot of editorial journalism, yeah. but it's much more observed in the in the in the in the in, in, in the breach in the breach rather yeah. than the observation mm -hmm. that most people serve well those who have the power and the money and the things yeah. are organized to benefit those who are already yeah. well off without having mm -hmm. much care for those that are not. No, we we um, we have a lot of lackings, but the greatest problem is the propaganda, which um, keeps American public, European public thinking that you know we're doing the best thing for the poor of the world. Yeah, people always but, do that, don't they? But no. we're, you know, the real things, the powerful people, the multinational corporations, uh, the world economy, the way it's structured, are structured for uh, those with greatest wealth to build up their wealth further. Yeah, and, and, and it's, also, it's at the expense of the poor. And the trends in that yeah. are not good. Right. It probably, I've seen some people, Stiglitz and others, who say that it probably 60 to 80 percent of the world population, we've got what, three, uh, uh, six billion or so, heading for 10, it looks like the UN says, and that 60 to 80 percent of the people are not well served by the system. Yeah. And the trends in that direction are not there, that we don't have a vision that's going to be able to include them in a full 
uh, realization of their potential, anything like their well, full potential. Yeah, so there's forth. been vision, like in 2000, the UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan. Millennium Goal. Yeah, right? presented uh. a Millennium d document which had eight main goals. Mm -hmm. And the first one, the most critical one, was that the number of hungry and extreme poor in the world would re be reduced from 800 million to 400 million by 2015. Is that just $2 a day or something? That's or one dollar that? a day. Well, that's one dollar a day. One dollar a day. Less than one dollar a day. Eight hundred million. And we've been doing that very well in meeting our Millennium no. Goal. We have 30,000 people average dying daily uh, fr because of poverty. Of these 18,000, how many? How many? 30,000 daily. A day. Okay. And 18,000 of these are children. Uh -huh. And it's because yeah. of this situation. So there are efforts now with this goal where 181 countries signed on to trying to achieve these goals. Uh -huh. But uh, the resources are very short. The, one of the goals was that the developed countries would try to meet their obligation and provide much more funding. Mm -hmm. The UN set long ago a goal of 0.7 percent, Yes, 70 cents on $100. Where is the United States on that? The U U.S. right now, the, the last bottom, I last I heard, they're the bottom. They're oh. 0 0.12. 0 0.1. I think Denmark, Scandinavian Denmark countries Denmark is 1.0. Zero. They, they lead. They in lead. The percentage of their yeah. gross domestic product. Is yes. Yeah. Gross gross uh, national product. Gross national product. Okay. Yeah. And the um, three other countries which are around that target. Scandinavian, I expect. Yeah, Norway, Sweden, and Netherlands are You're around the target. Your Scandinavian background. Yes. So you didn't start this fire, <laughs> no. as, as Billy Joel tells us, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah. the problem is the resources aren't enough. Uh, the last figure I saw was that at our halfway mark to 2015, mm -hmm. we are now 850 million uh -huh. extreme poor and growing by 5 million a year, but the percentage is going down. Uh -huh. So now they're trying to, some people are percentage publicizing, term. well, we're going towards the percentage reduction at least. That's called spin <laughs> yes. in the PR industry. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, fortunately there are some people, like here in New York, there's a man named Jeffrey Sachs, yeah. well, okay. director of the Earth Institute. Yes, at Columbia. Yeah. yeah, and he's doing a great, making great efforts. He wrote a book called uh, Ending Poverty in Our Lifetime. Yeah. I hear he's a very committed person. The sense of direction, I don't know how much his approach is grassroots mm -hmm. rather than top-down, but I feel he's an extremely sincere person. Um, I'm hoping to have a teleconference. He's in Asia right now, uh -huh. but um, Virginia Klein, who helps me. Yes, I know. She's very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, she has arranged that in the second week of September, I'll be able to talk to him by teleconference. Okay, very good. That's because we have been achieving the reduction not only in percentage, but in numbers. Uh -huh. And you're also dealing yeah. with the structural right. addressing of it. Because a lot of things, as you can get some, it's a structural thing. He, Jeffrey Sachs, the same one who brought shock therapy to the Soviet Union. I know the Soviet Union's got a gross domestic product now about comparable to Portugal. Yeah, I well, mean, and they got a kleptocracy. Yeah, I and don't they've know. Got, they've had a lot of implosion going on, right. and you got the gated communities emerging, and all those kind of things. They've been co-opted, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, but anyway, I, I but uh, good luck with the yeah. uh, with the thing. Now, one of the problems is Father Bill mm -hmm. Christensen, uh, William Christensen. We don't have enough time. Yeah. Now I don't know if the Lord could do something about giving us more time, but we've got too much to try and get into one <laughs> hour, right? And I know you brought in. You've got a DVD with a couple of clips. Yeah. And we want to be sure and get those in, so maybe right. you could uh, set, as they say, set up uh, the first clip that we have and uh, let us know what it is, and then we could show yeah. that. This is a, a video based on a program we had with the European Union. Okay. We had a program from 99 to 2003, and we did this at the end of the program as mm -hmm. a summary of the work. It shows our integrated development. So I want to show the first six minutes of this okay. initially. And this is the integrate, again, the title of the uh, organization is? The Institute of Integrated Rural Development. Okay. 
and the program, the video is called Melody of Sunshine. Okay, let's set that up and run that now then. Yeah. If you could, please, and we're talking with uh, Bill Christensen. Only two years ago, she was completely penniless. There was only a small patch of homestead land, but there was no house on it. She was hardly able to eat one meal a day and was forced to keep herself and her family alive by begging. After only two years, this miserable life story turned into a bright future. It is the story of the life of Amirun Begum of Jod Thunot village under Dhunot Upazila, under Bogra district. Not only Amirun Begum, but also another 13,000 destitute villagers have found a new way to live with food security, decent shelter and regular incomes sufficient for the entire family through the intervention of the Do Not Integrated Development Project known as DIDP. DIDP believes that the problem of poverty in Bangladesh can only be solved if poverty is eradicated among the poorest of the poor. Amirun Begum and many others like her are now enjoying these benefits and are leading decent lives. DIDP began working with the poor of two unions of Dhunot in 1986 and is working in 10 unions today. From the very beginning, it has maintained a focus on those living their lives in the worst poverty and has worked together with them to improve their living standards. DIDP classifies the target families into three categories, the hardcore poor, the very poor, and the less poor. DIDP is the local extension of the Institute of Integrated Rural Development, or IIRD, which implements development works in six upazilas of Bangladesh. IIRD plans and implements all development activities in an integrated way, so they have the most benefits for the target families. IIRD considers the target families as its development partners. Various programs such as roadside afforestations, sericulture or poultry have been undertaken to provide target families with a solid economic foundation. Under this project, more than 100,000 trees were planted on 187 kilometers of roadsides. Furthermore, development partners received 60% of the profits from the sale of wood when trees are cut or pruned. IIRD and the local authorities both receive another 20%. <laughs> IIRD takes these plantations as another tool for poverty eradication. Nearly 50,000 mulberry trees have been planted along roadsides in Thunot, which enables DIDP to operate the sericulture program. 
The leaves of the mulberry trees provide fodder for the silkworms raised by the female development partners. Because of the mulberry plantations, the silk industry has been flourishing and providing many households with substantial incomes. Once it was thought that silkworm rearing was not possible outside of Rajshahi. But IIRD has developed the silk industry in Dhunot in Netrukona and in Kochua Upuzela of Chandpur district. About 1,500 development partners are now earning their livelihood through this industry. The products are sold at IIRD sales outlet in Dhaka. The money from the sales goes back to the development partners. Most of IIRD's development partners are women. Halima Khatun of Bohalgacha, a silk industry worker, says that she is not only able to earn her living through DIDP, but that the organization even provides for her security. A few months ago, her one-year-old son drowned in a nearby water body. Wow, that's really beautiful. Well put together. Who put that together? Did you all put that uh, There's a group, the first private TV station in Bangladesh. Uh -huh. we, we asked them to do it for us. They did a good job. They, they did a very fine job. We had some photographs of the sericulture, yeah. but we don't have to. We showed there, right. and that was really good. I'd like to spend some yes, time please. on a uh, garment factory. Okay, please. See, we, um, we also uh, have had an association with an organization in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm which you know, the Center for Economic and Social Justice. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. Dr. Norman Curlin's group. Uh -huh. He was over with us twice for a couple of weeks each time. Mm -hmm. And uh, a group of the professionals who met him mm -hmm. formed a branch in Bangladesh. Uh -huh. And uh, we took up a project um, to do something about the garment factory workers. Uh, it might be worthwhile mentioning the uh, mission statement of the uh, uh, of Norman's enterprise well, because it's kind of unique in a way. Yeah. I, w I would like to because of the time limit. Okay. Okay. But okay. Um, it's just that they, yeah. they they favor the idea of expanding ownership among right. some of the people that have traditionally had no ownership of the what's right. involved in the productive yes. process. Yeah, to right. change the world economy, mm -hmm. to get ownership to be democratic, that yeah. everyone participates in ownership. Yeah, that's a huge idea yeah. that is right. uh, in the breach for right. the most part. Yeah, and so um, because labor no longer produces wealth as much as capital does. Uh, by a wide ratio <laughs> yes. in the trends. There. So yeah. unless people own capital, they won't be able to have a, a decent share in the wealth they need to live decent lives mm -hmm. and to uh, promote their families and their futures. Right. So uh, in Bangladesh, there's two million uh, workers in the ready-made garment sector. It, okay, accounts, for yeah, huh. it accounts for 76% of our foreign exchange earning. Holy Toledo, really? Yeah. Okay. Is it's that all the way from textile making itself to fashioning uh, well, garments? Well, we just do the sewing in Bangladesh. Uh -huh, okay. The cloth is brought in from other places. From, from where? Thailand, Malaysia, other countries. Okay, I don't mean to pry why. Why do they not do it domestically we on don't the have, We don't really have any cotton growing anymore, very little. Uh -huh. So the cloth the materials have to be brought in from elsewhere. Okay. And then we do the sewing. We have inexpensive, cheap labor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's built up. There's been a lot of, this only began in the 19, early 1980s. Mm -hmm. And it's built up rapidly because of the large number of entrepreneurs and investors who are Bangladeshi mostly. Okay. Uh -huh. Wealthier and middle class. So we have the what's called the, the sweatshop problem that right. most of these factories are 
exploiting the workers who are mostly young rural women right, who right. come to help their families, some by sending back some uh, fund, but the situation, the conditions are so poor, mm -hmm. their living conditions, their working conditions, that uh, there have been some studies showing that when they first come to work in the factories, 8% of the workers have some serious illness. You mean uh, as they come to work yeah. or as they work? When they, they, when they come. But uh -huh. within three years, the percentage with serious illness goes up to about 60 percent. Holy Toledo, really? Because they're, okay. they're uh, uh -huh. living in very poor slum conditions with uh, not sanitary drinking water. Yeah. Charles Kernigan Char with Charlie the National Labor great. Committee yeah. is doing uh -huh. a great mm -hmm. work in terms of uh, yeah. uh, exposing the treatment of these people, yeah. not only in Bangladesh, but mm -hmm. around the world, China. Latin America, Jordan, everywhere Egypt. in the world. It's a race to yeah. the bottom to take right. advantage of near slave labor right. conditions mm -hmm. that can be put down upon the people who are so poor. Right. Take advantage of them. Yes. So we've okay. been trying to get, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we designed and got a business plan for a worker owned garment factory. A worker owned? Yes, 75%. Okay. We would have a 500 worker factory, a four line factory it's called, mm -hmm. uh, in rented facilities. And we would um, um, have the um, production for the regular buyers at the normal, n normal standard of quality, uh -huh. timely production, and at the normal price. 75% uh -huh. of the factory would be owned by the uh, workers. The workers. 15% by the management and administration. And the other 10? And 10% would be by this... Um, branch of the Center for Economic Social Justice, uh -huh. which would reinvest that in further worker ownership. And trying to expand the idea of yeah. worker ownership. In Bangladesh. So you're getting them in a little bit yeah. on the entrepreneur, I mean the, the ability to be owners rather than just workers within yeah, the process. We want this one factory That's a huge to, idea. Yeah, to be yeah. a model, uh -huh. probably not just in Bangladesh, but right. internationally. Exactly. But we will be a member of the big uh, organizational group for the industry called the Bangladesh Garments Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Okay, I we'll be a member. We'll try to influence them so that more and more the owners of the present factory see that by sharing the ownership with workers, mm -hmm. they will be better received by the uh, public in the developed countries who are uh -huh. becoming more and more aware uh -huh. thanks to people like Charlie Kernaghan and them, yeah. the National Labor Committee. Uh -huh. um, so we... Um, Rev Billy also. I don't know him the, so well. Yeah, but Rev Billy, is yeah. uh, the Church of Stop Shopping is bringing some attention to younger people about yeah. the exploitation around the world. Mm -hmm. And Rev Billy, who a lot of the young people would know, mm -hmm. is uh, Charlie Kernaghan's his uh, hero. Yeah. As it is a lot of people on the campuses in right. this country and so forth, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we've got it now set up. We've <coughs> got funding arranged. Um, the majority of the funding for starting is coming from the government of Spain. Interesting. Through yeah. an NGO there. Um, we have a fund also from the Public Welfare Foundation in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and a fund from the Marianists, the okay. Society of Mary. Right. And we also have from a couple individual donors some fund, and we have a couple thousand dollars even from Charlie Kernigan's group. Okay, good. Who yeah, are right. always struggling for funds of their own. Right. But they're very supportive to this effort. So we're, um, we're ready to start. We have enough funding for starting as a uh, subcontracting unit. Uh -huh. But it wouldn't be so profitable. We need also a million dollars in the... Uh, in the bank as collateral for bringing in the raw materials and things when we get the orders. Yeah. And we'll usually have three or four orders in process before the first one is paid. Yeah, you got to get in on yeah. that. the supply so chain, yeah. the way the world right. works. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we've been contacting different groups for that. Uh, I was supposed to have a meeting with Macy's here at the suggestion of yeah. the... Um, Washington, D.C.-based International Center for Research on Women. Okay. Yeah. So they suggested yeah, it's that mostly we women, yeah. contact, but Macy's now has opted out of funding internationally. 
Okay. This uh, is one of the great problems uh -huh. in the U.S. U.S. is often the private charity is said to be a model of generosity, but I learned three years ago that 98% of American private contributions are spent in the U.S. Yeah, it's to benefit for them, universities, yeah. for art, for yeah. drama, for high schools, for whatever. Right, and right. very only 2% gets outside the country. Yeah, uh, it's too easy to perceive yeah. that the whole thing is what they call a race to the bottom because they're mm -hmm. going to take advantage of low wages and take mm -hmm. advantage of that, whether it's China, Bangladesh, uh, right. Central America, wherever. Mm -hmm. And you gave me figures, maybe it would be worth mentioning, that say a shirt, that the labor component amounts <laughs> to about 11 cents. Well, maybe this, you this was several that. years ago yeah, when I studied. Yeah. But the making of the shirt, for each shirt, the women who made them were paid 11 cents. Okay. The women who sewed them. Right. The factory owners in, Bang in Bangladesh were getting $2 and it was either 29 or 69 cents per shirt. So that's a markup from 11 cents to $2.90. Well, cents. they had the raw materials and the running yeah. of the factory, electricity and everything yeah. to think of uh -huh. and to well, pay their... True their uh, administrative and managerial people. But so for the labor for the women yeah. that you're concerned with, it's 11 cents. I, 11 cents. The uh, factory owners the labor, was yeah. two something. And then these shirts were sold in the U.S. for $29. That's a markup that is almost staggering <laughs> beyond belief, that yes. sort of thing. And then they right. say we should not be paying them, if, the, if we listen to strong market principles, yeah. we should not have to pay them 11 cents. We should only pay them 10 cents. They can get by with a little less milk <laughs> and so forth because if we yeah. don't, them in China, they're going to. And that's called a race to the bottom where you can yeah. just create Dickensian right. slave system mm -hmm. down upon people. And that is the trend right. operative in the world now. Yeah, there, there's very much the trend this. Is a get, the trend yeah. is disquieting as the actual yeah. reality. The U.S. and European Union and other wealthy countries are pressing for strengthening the World Trade Organization so that the World Trade Organization can uh, compel the poorer countries to liberalize, to open their markets more, as the World Bank and IMF have been pressurizing them to do for uh, the past couple decades. So the whole effort of the developed countries is to further colonize <laughs> uh, in the world economy, colonize the poorer uh, countries so that they'll open up their markets. They won't develop their own They won't uh, bother. Industries. They won't yeah. uh, be coming up with pesky environmental standards or quality standards or human well, rights issues or any of those kind well, of things even, even to get in the way of the pig heaven of right. people who can exploit labor. And one wonders right. if the labor is so c small, why is that such a strong factor in terms of this globalization where everything's going to China, everything's going to India, everything's going to somewhere else? when the mm -hmm. labor is so small. And the people who say, well, it's entry level and they will work their way up and they'll be brought up in the mm -hmm. middle class, that kind of thing, does not seem to be spelled out by the uh, trends that you can see, by the way you work and so forth, well, unless we get something yeah. going along the lines of what you're trying to do? Or yeah, I think we need to have massive changes in the world economy. Thank you, the thank you, yes, yes. Yeah, we have to have that. And this is the way to do it, the way that Kerland and others are promoting, mm -hmm. that it be worker uh, ownership and not just worker ownership, but people's ownership. Everyone, even those who are not workers. What about, what about people who will say, if you could, who, if, like the, you've had a lot of Marxists and people were very concerned about the plight of the least advantaged and they would say that it's the capitalists that exploit them and so forth. If they say, well, why don't we just set up a, a the, the word ownership has an onerous quality to in the lips or the minds of many people because that represents the ownership class, the capitalist class. And the idea that people are going to have an ownership runs against the labor theory of value and all of the values yeah. that motivate what might be called mm -hmm. the, the left wing, as it were, or yeah. the progressive community. And they seem to have been blindsided by mm -hmm. this idea that there's no, that is wrong, wrong, wrong for the yeah. poor of the world to have any ownership of technological mm. aspects or another than labor aspects mm. of production. That seems to be, in my humble opinion, the biggest question that confronts us all 
to get over the limitations in terms of the mm. progressive community getting behind the idea of bringing the people into the world mm. the way things are actually being produced rather than a myth called the labor theory of value. Right. We, you do we, believe that? Yeah, I, well, That's I... That's a huge idea. Yeah, I believe we have that misfortune of being tied to the old theory mm -hmm. that labor produces wealth, mm -hmm. whereas actually labor and capital together produce wealth. Labor used to produce wealth. Well, there more was and nothing more, more than to, yeah. labor. In but Tom Jefferson's day, there was nothing more than about 10% yeah. of something was other yeah. than labor. They've been reversed. But it has to be, the, concept, the con concept has to be changed, and the economists and others are resisting that. All economic theory is no. predicated upon the labor theory of value. The only way you're going to distribute. Not Louis Kelso. Well, except that. <laughs> except that exception, possibly Libya. They're trying to yeah. move against that. Yeah. But that's, so, that's such a hoary truth. That's the thing yeah. that's so. Uh, right. And that the, the, the people are going to. So but it's the prog usually it's the progressive people who are concerned with the plight of the least among us. And they, the progressive community, has been blindsided, yes. in my view, by, yes. s by saying we will not link them to mm -hmm. ownership by which they could have a flow of income coming to them yeah. because it's wrong and we should socialize mm -hmm. everything and do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, I think that's the biggest well, problem. Well, what we have to humanity. do, Carol, Harold, is mm -hmm. we have to help move the system in this new direction. Mm -hmm. Like we're involving Walmart. Yeah. The biggest. Yeah, I saw the letter from them. Uh, the biggest um, uh, company, company in the in world, the world now. Yep. Yeah. The most, uh, the biggest income. They are. They have agreed to provide us the market as full a market as well, we need. Well, not on a. But uh, no. you know, to with our it. with our commitment yeah. to uh, produce timely and standard quality goods and at standard market prices. And it was at a, it was at the under the letterhead of a man concerned with ethics there. Yes. So okay, that's interesting. That's the yeah. thing so that could motivate people. This engagement people, but, not, uh, but people are going to say that's running against the market because you can exploit those people more and there'll be market fundamentalists yeah. who say that runs against the ideas of anything other than We some have to run against the okay. present system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh -huh. I think there, there has to be more and more realization of that, and I think it will happen. System in place is not serving well the vast majority of the people, and the trends are in that direction against serving the interests of the masses of the people of the world. We have to have a fundamental kind of change. It seems yeah. to me the work you've been doing, Norman, and other people have been doing, Charlie Kernighan has been doing, is something that is something that we could all repair to, and it seems to be a lot of young people mm -hmm. and other people are are, are, as they say, cottoning on to that idea. Right. No, we're, we're almost out of time, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, I think we have to do that, and I think there is, I hope the young people in U.S. will be like the young people in Europe, uh -huh. but I hear that the young people in the U.S. are more worried for financial security rather than meaningful well, lives. Th that's what keeps everything <laughs> in, the, in the same track that it's been in. That's Charlie Kernighan told me yesterday. Yes. In 1970, surveys showed that 80% of the young people were more concerned for having meaningful philosophy of life, mm -hmm. purposes in life. What about now? Today, it's 20%, oh. and the 80% is financial security. Yeah, but it's because the system is so out of kilter with I what's know. needed in terms of human liberation. Your yes. work, it seems Thank to you. me, is really uh, uh, dedicated work over a long period, which I congratulate you and all of your colleagues on and doing and setting a model. All the very best in all that you're trying to do. And I really appreciate your kind finding time to come in and talk with